Hello and welcome to Trading Growth and Value Stocks. My name is James Boyd. We welcome all of you here today on this special shirt day. I only wear this one on Christmas, Thanksgiving, or any other special day I could think of. Today being one of those days. We'd like to welcome everyone here. We also have Lee Bull in the chat, and uh, we welcome him as well. He's a fellow instructor, and he teaches a couple classes throughout the week, which we'll show you on the calendar in just a moment. Now, just real quick, today, uh, what determines the company's profitability? What does that profitability have to do with earnings per share? We're going to really be talking about that here today as we get into really week six of our curriculum. Now, just a quick reminder, we talked about last week uh, comparing stocks fundamentally. This week, we'll talk about income statements. Next week on week seven, we'll talk about understanding balance sheets and also looking at on week eight, talking about looking at uh, what we call time series analysis. We're going to be looking at data, economic data, or I should say fundamental data over time to track really what that company is doing over time to see if it's strengthening over time and also what might the forecast be as well? Now, just real quick as we get started, uh, just a quick reminder, this information here is for general informational purposes only. It should not be construed as an uh, individualized recommendation or endorsement of any particular security chart pattern or investment st uh, strategy. Also remember that Schwab does not recommend the use of technical analysis as a sole means of research. Also remember we will be using the paper money software application, also known as the desktop, also remember when we talk about examples, they are just that. Now today, what we really wanna focus on is we will take a look at the market. We'll talk about any effect, if any, on the two portfolios. We'll also get into really income statements. What are they? We'll break them down. We'll also be looking for application of what might the investor be looking for, for stronger examples, but also maybe weaker examples as well. And then we have a number of examples we can look at using the material that is gonna be taught. So first off, uh, when we all first got married, they said for better or for worse, this shirt, my wife actually says, this is what they mean by worse, okay? Um, you know, I just say, sometimes I like to test your love and uh, walk down the mall with my wife and uh, just see if she's holding my hand the whole entire time. Uh, so, so I don't know. She says, you're, you're being annoying. I, I'm not trying to be annoying, okay? It's my favorite shirt. Just let me be, okay? Love me for who I am, will you? All right, a little fun there. Now, just real quick, let's take a look at the market. Let's kind of talk about the effects of what it did to the portfolios. Let's kind of break it down. So first off, we spent some time yesterday talking about downtrends in the short term, right? We'll get to that on the SPX. This line was the line or the low from uh, just where we were on 4, 4, April 4th. We did see a confirmation of a lower low in the Dow on the shorter term. We can't say something as ludicrous as a bear market, but we could actually say that, hey, it broke down in the shorter term. Okay, confirmed. When we go back to the SPX, which is really kind of what we've been using as a benchmark and a proxy, uh, kind of zoom in on this. This white line was really the line that diagonal support, okay? And really on the date of August 4th, we went down below that. And we made these comments such as price breaks support. Okay, fine, I think we get that. Number two, as the price breaks support, we actually made a lower low, okay? And that lower low tends to be like two to three days after the break of support. It's quick because the price just fell. Now, number three is where we a lot of times get faked out. What do we mean by that? Well, number three is where we go from it made a lower low after breaking support, and then the price goes up for one, two, three days. And it's almost like people fall in love with the color of the candle and forget that you're now below support in the short term. So number three is probably the most, uh, the thing you have to be careful of the most, if you see the price broke support, made a lower low, and an experienced investor would know that that up move is probably gonna be short-lived, probably three days or less. The price tends to use the moving average as a resistance, or it retests where it broke down from. After that, that price tends to drop and makes a lower low, confirming a short 
long-term downtrend. And so far, that's what we're getting. Now, again, we would not say something as ludicrous as bear market, okay? But sometimes in the short term, you do get pullbacks like this. So just be prepared. The pullbacks are a part of the upward trend, okay? The trend, like our breathing, tends to exhale occasionally or should if it wants to be living in the long term. The big thing is in this case is we just kind of consolidate and we try to see what areas of support we might try to hold on to. This area, like say 51.18 or so, might be a horizontal level. If we go down further, let's say 49.85. This is why when we go up, it's critical that we make some support levels along the way. Now, on Monday, we talked about the RSI. The reason why we wanted to bring up the RSI is that it already broke down before the price did. You didn't check out the class on Monday? We talked about some of the questions I've been getting on that, and then we kind of use the RSI to kind of read that. We label that class as the seven variations of the RSI and uh, kind of notice some interesting things there. Now, NASDAQ, just real quick. NASDAQ, well, didn't fall as much. Still a little weakening on the RSI if we include that, but what you're going to notice on the NASDAQ as we zoom in, flattening still. The thing that we would say if we're just being truthful, which we always should be, is really it is still making lower highs there's an equal high this is a lower high relative to that so we can't really say the nasdaq is completely out of the woods yet okay now but what's the effect on the portfolios you have to understand that not everyone's portfolio is going to be affected the same people have different ways they set it up or they have different ways in which they manage it briefly when we look at the margin account Okay, 56,241. I changed this so we can kind of see the effect of today. And on the margin account, it's up $397. And the bulk of that, if not all of it, the majority came from Meta. Okay, and that was $420. So if we didn't have Meta, it wouldn't be up, It'd be almost flat. But what you're going to see in this case is the margin was not down, it was up. Now, the Dow, if we take a look at this, it was down 422 points. But you got to remember, the index is not at 10,000. The index is at 384. So the Dow was just a, down a whopping 1%. Unbelievable. Backbreaking. Not really. Down 1%. Not huge. When you look at the S&P, it wasn't even down 1%. And if you look at, let's say, the NASDAQ, it was, I don't even think it was down 1% either. We go back, it was down 8 tenths of 1%. Now, if we look at, let's say, the IRA, you're going to notice when we look at the IRA, how bad was it? We're going to look at this profit loss all the way down, scroll down, scroll down. What do we got? This was down $865. So if we said an aggregate margin in the IRA, how bad? It was down about $450-ish, $867 on a portfolio that was maybe about uh, – I'm just going to kind of put it here. Let's say it was about 221,000. Uh, let's say, I don't know, let's say it was 600 yesterday. It's down uh, four tenths of 1%. Now, a lot of times people don't like to kind of track and state things statistically when things are down. I think that is the most vital. So what we see is a split. The margin didn't have as many stock positions. We talked about that because we've been talking about exits and five and 10 day lows. And what you're going to notice is the IRA, a little bit more damaging, but really not completely horrible, okay? Uh, now, but we also did spend more time on the, uh, the margin account yesterday in our class. Now, what I want to do just real quick is let's kind of now go into the material that we want to teach, and then let's look for examples, okay? So first thing what I want to kind of do is I want to kind of talk about really the, why is the income statement important? Okay, so when you look at, let's say, evaluating a company, three different types of reports that we really like to take a look at. Number one, income statement, uh, as we'll talk about, balance sheet and the cash flow statement. So really the income statement, now, the, by the way, this could be uh, in terms of your own personal life and or business. The income statement we would just call as a financial report card for the company. People do not go to work typically just to have fun with low, uh, fellow employees. They're there. They're hired to make money for the company. 
So when we actually take a look at the income statement, it's not just for an undefined period of time. As investors, we want to see a quarter to quarter report card. Hey, how's the company doing? Now, the biggest thing is the investors on a quarterly basis, they want to see, hey, your plan from, from the company's point of view, is it working? And we want to see the financial performance for the quarter. We would also even, if we can, ask you questions and, and kind of maybe get some ideas where the company might be going into the future. Now, the real question from investors is, is it profitable? Okay, I don't think many people invest in companies that they think they're going to lose money, okay, just for fun. They want to know, is it being profitable? Now, I want to kind of now go into, for example, some of the key pieces, okay, of this income statement. When we talk about this, we're going to talk about the revenue. We're going to talk about what's called cost of goods sold. We'll talk about gross profit, okay? We'll talk about also uh, SG&A. I'll just label that as short. We'll talk about operating profit or income. And then we got to get down to the last two, which is interest, okay? And those, well, it's almost around the corner, taxes. So let's kind of talk about these little pieces right here. Let's kind of talk about what they are and what's the significance. And then how are we going to use the information to find candidates, okay? Because that's really what the, I mean, why talk about the information if you can't apply it? So I want to kind of talk about revenue for just a second. And what I want to kind of do in this case is what affects the revenue? So when I say revenue, we're, we are also saying sales. What affects the sales or revenue, same thing, of the company? Now, this is really big. I think a lot of times we don't kind of connect two to two. So I want to kind of, let's say, kind of bring up some things where what kind of controls the revenue. So a couple things that we could probably think of would be, let's say, superior products. Uh, may maybe the product that company A is selling is just better than what the other ones are, are selling, okay? The second part of this, it could be a stronger economy, okay? The third part of this could be if it's a stronger economy, might there be more of a willingness to spend and or invest money? Another part that we kind of maybe don't connect a lot of times is regulation. If there's regulation like Tesla's had, that, hey, if you buy the Tesla car, you can get a potential tax rebate. That can also inflate sales of the company, okay? Decrease in interest rates, decrease uh, ultimately decreasing potential borrowing costs, and or the overall cost to purchase. So these are some things that actually affect the revenues, okay? Now, the other one, oh my gosh, how could I actually forget? Now, I'm going to put Eva right here. I'm going to say at Eva, okay? And we're going to label this as moat. Now, Eva, since you're here with us, can you explain to us what we really mean by moats? Now, there are some companies that, for example, they might have, let's say, patents, okay, uh, copyrights, you name it, okay, and I'm just labeling copyrights, et cetera, where other companies cannot copy something that they actually, uh, something that their competitor made, and they might not be able to copy it for a certain length of time, and then after that certain length of time expires, you might get generic type of products that come out that try to copy. So the funny thing about success is your competitors will actually tend to copy what is working. And they'll try to say, hey, ours is just as good. And a lot of times it's probably not, okay? So the biggest actually thing is when we said this, uh, the comic saying strategic advantage, barriers to entry, love that, Doug. So barriers to entry might be what? Capital to get the investor. Okay, it might be, let's say, management. They have experience, right, among other things. Pamela says, Moat, how many other companies sell your product? Okay, we could include that as well, like that. So uh, so the biggest thing, actually, thing is, think of the moat as like a castle. And then around the castle, there's separation between the castle and where the other people are. So the moat, the water around the castle, could be patents, copyrights, 
anything that would stop your competitors from quickly invading your space and eating away your market share of that industry group or sector. Okay, now, so great comments on that, really like that. I think a lot of times we kind of don't really pay attention to some of these things and probably should. Now, one of the things I wanna kind of talk about is when we talk about the revenue as well, we might also even kind of bring up here and we say revenue, we might even say new technology. Now, I think you, you know, we probably have to have our head in the sand if we did not hear like this last year about AI, okay? New technology, okay? And so that new technology can actually, let's say an existing company, or it might drive, let's say a new industry group, such as, uh, Bitcoin, okay, something like that, or let's say, uh, whatever. Uh, and when I say when I say Bitcoin, I'm really kind of saying crypto, okay. Crypto obviously carries risk, not suitable for all investors. But if that new technology, it, could, it might not just be something that adds to the company itself. It might be new technology that leads to a new industry group, okay, like crypto, that leads to potential interest from investors. OK, so this is very important because this magnifies a lot and or can really take away and hurt the business and or the group as a whole. Now, what are the opposites? OK, well, what's the negative? Well, if we kind of just flip what we just said positive, we could actually see that if the company did not have these things, OK, it could really hurt the company in a bad way. OK. And it could be maybe a bearish example. Now, the one thing is I, I want to kind of bring up too, what is maybe uh, something that like could hurt the revenue slash sales? I think the one thing that we could actually include, and I'm going to bring up the company Eva talked about before is BA, right? You might actually have, let's say, a uh, risk to using, okay, the product, okay? Now, is there a risk? Has there been, been a risk? Might this actually cause uh, consumers or buyers to be mm, concerned, okay, to buy now or sooner than later, okay? And I'll even include at the same price, okay, which could, by the way, hurt that revenue. Now, the other part of this is, you know, a company like Boeing, for example, they now actually face, let's say, longer potential, okay, uh, times to sell, I should say, produce items because everything's magnified 10 times, right? But they also have now potentially in, in, increased regulatory, okay, safety, scrutiny, okay? Sorry for the spelling on this. So you, you see where that can go negative, right? If you have a situation where maybe there's kind of a doubt on maybe using the product or service, and then the company tries to correct it, that is now gonna just increase the cost, and you might even actually have scrutiny on it as well. The reason why I'm kind of like throwing this out here, spending a little bit more time, I don't think a lot of times we actually kind of link back to what is the most important piece of this statement, revenue, okay? Now, I wanna kind of talk about just real quick the second part of this, which is the cost of goods sold, okay? So the example I like to give is if, if you, let's say if you bought an Apple phone, okay, and you buy it for X amount, the company has an investment in selling you that product. There was labor used to sell the product, there was materials used, there was overhead, et cetera. And we call that the cost of goods sold. Now, we know, living here in the United States of America, some of your Canadians, maybe it's not as much, but what's the cost of labor done as of lately? What's the cost of materials done lately? What's the cost of overhead done lately? Okay, and well, lately, I'm saying the last one, two years. Well, we know that a lot of those things, when we, we have persistent price increase, all of these three typically on most companies has increased. So what is that going to really do? it's gonna push up the cost of goods sold. Why does it matter? Well, when we get down to, for example, what we call gross profit, again, we're looking at the dollar, we're looking at in dollar terms, we're talking about the revenue 
minus cost of goods sold. So the biggest thing is if you have, let's say, inflation where it keeps driving up and you're the company where your cost of labor, materials, and overhead are increasing, companies might be, let's say, their gross profits might be under pressure. But as an investor, you want to be aware of that. Are, is the company you have, are they doing a good job of controlling their cost of labor, their cost of materials, their cost of overhead? And or are they having to push up or are they able to push up what that price is being sold for? Because what happens if this goes up, but they can't sell the item for higher? Where does the gross profit go? It goes down. Okay, you see that? So we're spending a little bit more time here because I think as maybe we, we're not talking about being consumers of stocks. Okay, we're talking about being an investor. We're talking about actually like thinking here. Okay, now the biggest thing what we're really trying to get to so we can kind of make it relatable is we're really looking at what's called the gross profit margin. And that gross profit margin is expressed in a percent. And that's just, just gross profit, GP, divided by revenue. That is really what we want to see. We're not trying to see necessarily what the dollar amount is. We're trying to see the percent so we can make it relatable to other stocks in the same industry or band or sector. So the first major takeaway is we are trying to get down to what is the gross profit margin percent. Now, are there any questions with this? Now, guys and gals, it doesn't matter if it's a bull market. It doesn't matter, let's say, if it's a bear market. This, what we just talked about, is really huge. I think a lot of times people don't really understand what is causing the prices on stocks to increase or index or sector to increase or go down. What we just talked about is huge. If you go back to markets like 2001, 2002, 07, 08, start of 09, these things took a hit, okay? And it all really starts with revenue, 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 and revenue, and more revenue, okay? And remember, we said that has a magnification effect, okay? Now, so super quick, let's kind of get to the, kind of finish this up here, and then we're gonna look at examples. So first off, when we actually go back, and we actually said, okay, when we actually say, we're gonna take this gross profit, right? Gross profit. And what we're going to do is kind of take this and just say, uh, let me move this up. Gross profit, we're just going to say minus SG&A. Just quick comment on this, okay? When we talk about SG&A, we are, that is just short for central uh, selling, general, and admin. This is all costs not related to the production of the good and services, like what, Okay. This could be wages of salespeople, which we love. We're not saying that's bad. I'm just saying that's not included in production, okay? Marketing and advertising departments, love those people too. And traveling expenses. This, these are items that are not related to the, uh, the development of actually the product or service. From here, what we're actually really getting to is really what's called operating profit, okay? And that, again, is expressed in terms of a dollar amount. So when we say operating profit, we're, that is just taking the gross profit minus SG&A. Okay, now, from this operating profit, same idea here, operating profit margin, okay, we want to get to the percent. What is that? Well, it's going to be the operating profit divided into the revenue and or sales. Same thing and it's gonna give us a percent, okay? Now, let's kind of look at the last thing here just real quick. And actually, let me do this. So first off, let me ask you a quick question. When you look at, let's say, gross profit margins, you look at, let's say, operating profit margins, are all sectors the same? Do you think they're the same, okay? Now, this is what might be a little shocking to us, okay? Because when you take a look at, let's say, a lot of these companies, you would think, oh, they're probably going to be all very, very, very similar. And what you would be surprised about is that's not true at all. Let me give you a quick example. So if you looked at utilities and you said, I'm going to look for a large cap company that's between, uh, let's say, $10 billion in market cap to $200 billion in market cap, I want $1 million plus in volume. 
how many stocks in there have a gross profit margin percent of greater than 6%? Answer, there's only six stocks. Only six, large cap, greater than a million on shit on average volume, greater than a million, only six, okay? Where the gross profit is greater than 30, six companies. Now, if we said the same thing with technology, there's 79 companies in that classification or categorization there. If we look at the discretionaries, there's 29 companies. And if you look at, let's say, energy, there's 24 companies. So what you're going to notice is when you look at, let's say, utilities or staples or healthcare, the margins, the percentages, gross operating and net profit margin, they're going to tend to be con contracted quite a bit, okay? That's why people like to go into areas like technology, discretionary, where the margin percentages are bigger, okay? Now, let's kind of finish this out. So if we kind of said, what are the two items that are missing? So if we stopped with actually operating profit, okay, in terms of dollar amount, we need to subtract out interest. We also need to subtract out also their taxes. And you get down to what's called net profit in terms of dollars, okay? Now that net profit, that's a big deal. This is where we start to now get into what we call earnings per share, okay? So if we said, why does it, for example, matter what the net profit is? Because now this plays into earnings per share. This now is the doorstep to valuation, okay? Now, if we said, well, what's the net profit margin percent? Well, that's just gonna be, in this case, what the net profit is, okay? Divided, divided by revenue, okay? Now, so when we look at companies, we're really looking for three main metrics. And I'll just label here in summation, gross profit margin percent, operating profit margin, which is stated in a percent, net profit margin, whoop, margin percent, okay? Now, what does this tell you about the company as a whole? What does it tell you about the leadership of the company? What does it tell you? And the answer is a lot, okay? As a good leadership of the company, you wanna see those margins improving, right? You wanna see that the management of the company is being a good steward, for example, uh, in terms of the, the corporate assets, right? So the biggest actually thing is when you look at this, okay, we wanna see that these numbers, what's the takeaway from this, right? What do we really wanna see? As an investor, what is it that we really want to see? Number one, I mean, if we could only have one thing, what do we want to see? Flat out revenue increasing. Historical or his, the history has been least positive. But the thing is a potential forecast of growth. Okay, that's huge. Now, second piece of this, we want to see, for example, that these are at a, at a minimum that they're holding on a they're holding on a percentage basis, okay, at a minimum, that they're at least staying the same or that they're increasing. And that would actually tell us that the company is being more efficient. And the last thing is that the margins are stronger than their peers. Because that really goes back to what we talked about last week, which is why would someone buy this company and maybe not as much the other companies? So what we want to do now is kind of look for companies where the revenue is increasing, the margins are actually at least flat to increasing over time, and that the margins are stronger than the peers. Now, the biggest thing about kind of like what's the homework assignment? My gosh, what's the takeaway from this? We should be looking for companies where that revenue is actually growing, okay? to the margins are actually flat to increasing, prefer increasing, of course. And then the margins are stronger than their peers and might that potentially continue. That is what you're really trying to find. Speaking of that, let's go take a quick peek. So what I wanna do is I wanna go to just real quick, uh, the schwab.com website. 
And what I want to do is I want to kind of bring up a couple of companies. And I couldn't, like when I asked myself those three questions, like, hey, we're, what are we really looking for? You know, it's kind of hard not to kind of, and I'm going to start with two, I'm going to focus on two different sectors, okay? The two sectors I'm going to focus on is really, I'm going to look at technology, which I did. And then I also looked at energy. Now, the biggest actually thing is, if you don't mind, if we go back to the portfolio on in the IRA, if you kind of said, well, how come the portfolio wasn't that more? How come the portfolio wasn't that more? Uh, CNQ is energy. Chevron is energy. S is energy. Google, oh my gosh, bear market down 80 cents. Maybe not. And what you're going to notice is they were in those two different areas. Those are the only four stocks we have in the whole entire IRA portfolio. So I'm going to kind of say, might we kind of stick with that thing perhaps? And what I want to do is I want to bring up, let's say, a couple of stocks that are in that area. And I want to start with, let's say, a company like HES, okay? Now, when we look at, let's say, HES, and we get to this page, let's just click on HES again. And now what it's going to do is load. So as investors, we want to ask ourselves, well, what has the company done itself? And then also, where does the company stand in terms of their peers? What might be the forecast going forward? Where do we see that information? Well, if we scroll down, what we're going to see is chart, news, dividends. Now, my page is zoomed in, so you probably wouldn't be doing the amount of scrolling I'm going to, but it's just because I'm zoomed in. Now, by the way, remember we said what was the most important piece of this? we would like to see that there is a forecast of expected earnings. So seeing these numbers by quarter, by quarter, by quarter go up, it does not mean they're going to do that, guaranteed. It is an estimate, okay? So seeing these numbers actually increase quarter over quarter, year over year, could be a potentially positive sign. Now, if we take a look and we scroll down, we can see history of estimate in dark blue, light blue, actual. They beat four times in a row. Could they continue? But now we start getting into this peers and the ratio comparison. Now, the big thing is we've talked about this tab before. We've talked about valuation and fundamentals. That's not what we're interested in. We're interested in this tab right here called the profitability. So now if we look at this company on the tab profitability, we now get into what we call the gross profit margin, the net profit margin, and the cash flow margin. Now, what you're gonna see in this case, if you said, I don't know what this is, click on the I, and we could actually see, well, what is it, okay? And you're gonna see that gives us a definition, and it even explains to us exactly what we said before. Same thing with net profit margin, okay, there it is. Okay, and if we said cash flow margin, what is that? And there you go right there, okay? Now, what I wanna do is I wanna look at Hess and I wanna compare it to, let's say, the other stock, other stocks that are populated in the same neighborhood. Gross profit margin, 71. Williams, WMB is 81. SU is 62. And what you're gonna notice is right here on uh, this ET, 22. Okay, now remember, if you're, you're trying to find profitability, probably not going to look at ET first. Now, here's what I think happens. I'm speculating. Could be wrong. I don't think people really look at the numbers a lot of times. they just so attracted by the, the chart, okay? The bottom line is if you're going to buy a car, don't just tell me, oh, it's a beautiful car. The wheels are amazing. You're going to open up the hood in the car just to make sure there's an engine in there, right? Okay, I'm going to buy blind here, okay? want to see where's the engine. Now, the big thing is when we take a look at this net profit margin, you're going to see that the second for the second time, WMB has outpaced Hess again. So what might be the thinking with that thought? Maybe go look at WMB too. Now, if we look at cash flow margin, WMB beats again. And now we actually get down to here where we can see cash flow per share. Okay. And by the way, what's your favorite two words? Cash flow. Okay, so now if you look at kind of say of these five, which ones might be the strongest? We might say Hess and WMB. So remember, we're trying to kind of windle down to maybe two max, three stocks and say, could we look at these and kind of let's verify the trends? Now, by the way, could we run this through our value sample plan? Yes. Could you run it through the growth sample plan? 
Yes. Okay. Now, if we look at these two companies, if we actually kind of bring up and say, what do you look like? Well, if we take a quick look at this, as we zoom in on this, this stock was not even down today. It opened up lower, but then the price went back up. Hmm. So this might be what Lee determines, potentially, Lee to let us know, what they call relative strength compared to maybe the index. It outperformed the index, maybe even the sector. We're kind of seeing like a little plateau of support. Now, this discussion here today is not kind of looking at, we're not kind of practicing the sample plan like we did the last three weeks. What we're going to do in this case is we're going to try to buy the stock in this paper money account, and we're going to be showing setting a stop right below that plateau of support, okay? Now, what you're going to notice is uh, that plateau of recent support is kind of right around 155.37, okay? 155.37, less 2 to 3%. If we did 2%, it's going to be right at 152.26, okay? 152.26. Now, what you're going to notice is if we set a potential target, uh, just a quick uh, comment here, Brent Moores on Tuesday afternoon has been really talking a lot about order types. If you do not take a listen to Brent Moore's class on learning think or swim, and you need to kind of practice on order types, et cetera. What do they mean? Uh, take a listen to Brent Moore's class on Tuesday afternoons. Those have been recorded. Now, if we go back and kind of say, well, what about a potential target on this? Where might that stock try to go to? Well, a path at least potential resistance. Let's say kind of right around that 164 high level, maybe 165. Now, Again, our purpose on this is not to do a trading class, but let's kind of say we tried to apply the material taught. We found a stock that was kind of one of the two stronger ones in the neighborhood and maybe Hess hitting the example. Now, here's the deal. This doesn't guarantee that the stock is going to go up. It's just a setup. So when you talk about a technical setup, you talk about fundamental setups, they're just setups. Could the stock go higher? We're going to see over time if it does. We're going to go to confirm and send. Note with stop orders, there's no guarantee that the execution price will be equal to or near the activation price. Note it. Send the order. And now we're going to try to add to that position, for example. Now, what I want to kind of do is show you a little compare and contrast. Now, there's a small company called Coca-Cola. Maybe you have heard of it before, okay? Now, we know Coca-Cola, you know, if you went to the local gas station, you can buy a 20-ounce bottle for 99 cents. Is that true? <laughs> no, I think it's like two for four, two for five, depending upon where you are. Not cheap, okay? Now, what does that probably tell us? Well, maybe the labor cost went up, right? Maybe uh, the overhead went up, right? A lot of it went up. So are they being able to sell the product for a higher amount. They're trying to, okay? Now, what I want to do is I want to kind of just compare and contrast. Now, what you'll notice is this stock price has been very, very flat over the last little bit. Why is that? Well, let's scroll down and kind of see the numbers, okay? Expected earnings. What do you see in terms of expected earnings? Is it like increasing like Hess? Or is it kind of maybe going the opposite direction? Kind of going the opposite direction. If we scroll down, what are you going to notice? Kind of a step down in Q4 a little bit, okay? And if we scroll down even more, we're going to go to what tab? We are going to go down to the profitability tab. If we click on that profitability tab, what we're now going to see is this company, and we'll look at one more, the gross profit margins for Coke, Pepsi, Diageo, Monster, Constellation, they're all about in the 50th percent. Now, if we take a look at, let's say, of the two companies, which company, for example, between Coke and Pepsi? Now, which one's more superior? We know that some of you are Coke people, and other of you said, I wouldn't drink that if, if I was in the Sahara Desert, 
Okay. The biggest actually thing is when you look at, let's say, Coke, the net profit margin, about twice, over twice as much as, let's say, Pepsi. But there's other companies in there like Monster that has a pretty good net profit margin as well. If we're looking at, the, say, the second highest, Diageo, the highest cash flow margin percent, okay, and you look at the cash flow per share, you see that there. Now, so I want to kind of bring this up because first off, remember we said, what is the investor really looking for? The investor is really looking for that revenue growing to increase the chances that the margin percentages would at least be holding at a minimum to increasing. Okay, and the biggest thing is that the margins are stronger than its peers. So if the revenue is flat, and the mar that it probably probably increases the chance that the margin percentages aren't increasing. So when we look at a company like let's say uh, Coca Cola, and we said, hey, what has Coca Cola done in terms of its revenue over time? Might want to go look at that and say, what has the revenue done year over year over year? Now, by the way. The other place we can see this information on over a year-over-year -year basis or a quarterly basis is right below. So this is where we've been. Right below that section, you're going to see where it says statements, and you're going to see balance sheet, income statement. And we can see in this column heading 23, 22, 21, 2019. Now, we're not looking at balance sheet. We'll look at balance sheet next week. If we look at, let's say, income statement, I click on that right there, we want to see what do we notice on revenue, okay? It has increased over time. Good. Now, what you're going to notice is total operating expense. It's also increased. So they sold more, but it costs more to actually do it. And when you look at the total operating income, it's increased. But again, investors, for example, are attracted to not just things that are growing in terms of dollar terms, but by percentages. So it has grown on the operating income over the last, let's say, four or five years. But is it growing at the same amount of other areas? So we're not saying it's not growing. It's just on a percentage basis, not growing as much as, let's say, what NVIDIA did. Speaking of that, if we compare to contrast and say, show me NVIDIA what this looked like and scroll down to the bottom, if we looked at this and said, well, what have they done? Well, notice what they just did. When we talk about revenue, 10.9, 16.6, 26, 26.9. In one year, the revenue went up twofold. When we talk about revenue, remember we talked about what influences the revenue? When we actually go down and say, well, what was the net income? Oh, oh, oh. okay, hello. Okay, that net income year over year from 23 to 24, it was a six or seven fold. See why people were attracted to it? So the biggest thing is why we spent more time talking about revenue is because if we hear things about like new technology, we know from, let's say, new technology that that can have a massive impact on what could actually drive uh, that revenue. Could be a stronger economy. Companies are more willing to spend in or invest uh, in that area because they want to kind of use that to enhance their own business, et cetera. Regulation, okay, uh, trends and in interest rates, et cetera. These are all things that could really drive the returns. Now, your homework assignment, okay, what I want to kind of give you a homework assignment is I want you to, for example, look for companies where that revenue is growing. I showed you the two resources right in the Schwab.com website where you can see that. You could see it compared to its peers, but you could also see it relative to itself. They were right by each other, right? The other thing is we want to see are those margin percentages, are those at least holding and or are they increasing? Okay. And the last thing is if you looked at the stock that you're considering, you might be saying, I'm setting a personal goal, the investor says, I like to find maybe something where it's in the top two stocks of the five that are shown to show something that is currently stronger and could it continue, okay? So your homework assignment is I want you to look at maybe two sectors that you like, dig into them, start looking at some of those stocks. Now, Beth, what's the easiest way to kind of filter stocks? Filter them by price, filter them by volume. 
If you said stocks over 40, you said stocks with an average volume of a million plus, you're going to get down to less than 10 stocks in a hurry, okay, especially in some sectors. Now, I'm out of my time here today, but next week what we're going to be doing is we'll talk about balance sheets. We'll talk about how we're not just talking about a period of time. We're talking about a point in time. And remember what we talked about in this, this all relates to earnings per share, which is the foundational concept to valuation. And so this is being this is very important because it also kind of tells us something about the efficiency of how the company is doing compared to its peers uh, and also how it's doing relative to itself. And sometimes, as we know from Warren Buffett, that the leadership of the company can be a huge piece as far as are they really managing the, the resources of the company effectively. I thank you for joining me on this special Fundamental Wednesday, on this special shirt day for me. And uh, thank you for uh, having a little fun with me as well here today. Now, I want to give you a quick reminder. Where do we get a playlist of prior classes that we could look at? Answer. This is the playlist of prior weeks that we taught. And if you just kind of go, you could start at, let's say, week one. Okay. Um, what's the, what is the stock potentially worth? Week one, week two, week three, week four, week five. Today being six. You could just go back to the first week. What is the stock potentially worth? Okay. So just know you can go back. Now, by the way, I, I review them more than once. That way you're really sure to pick up on the information. Also, uh, tomorrow we'll kick off futures tomorrow morning at 9.30 a.m. Eastern. And I want to thank you so much for attending today's class uh, on trading growth and value. Uh, also, quick reminder that uh, with what we discussed, it was done for example, illustrative purposes only. Remember that all investing involves risk. Thank you, Lee, and thanks to all of you. And make sure you subscribe to the Trader Talks channel by Schwab Coaching. With that said, I, I wish you a great day, and we'll see you back tomorrow at 9.30 a.m. Eastern. Take care. Bye-bye.